All right, everyone, we're recording. This meeting is being recorded. I'm at my last slide, which I don't want to be at the last one. Uh, where'd you go? Here you go. All right, share screen. All right, can everybody see that screen? All right, awesome. Well, thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Cameron Perry, and I'm a PhD student at Georgia Institute of Technology here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I work closely with Georgia Aquarium. And I work um, in the research and conservation department on a lot of the whale shark research that they're doing at the aquarium and in the field. Um, my background, I was in Florida, uh, did my master's also on whale sharks. So I've been studying the species for about eight years. In my master's, I was looking at the age of growth of whale sharks out of the Maldives. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the chapters of my PhD, where we went and we explored whale sharks in this really small, remote uh, uh, island in the South Atlantic. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what this title covers, whale shark biology, ecology, their threats, and then how Georgia Aquarium is helping unravel the mystery of this iconic species. So I'm going to throw probably a lot of information at you. I can talk about whale sharks for days. So if you have any questions, feel free to save them at the end, and I will love to answer them and talk about them. So first things first, let me introduce the whale shark. Uh, its genus and species is Rhynchodon typus. It first appeared in the fossil record around 60 million, million years ago. However, the first specimen was recorded by science when it was harpooned off the coast of South Africa in 1828. So still kind of pretty recent in that evolutionary time span. Um, since then, we've begun to learn a lot more about whale sharks. We know that they are the largest fish in the sea, uh, with maximum sizes reaching 18 to 20 meters. So that's pushing 60 feet. Uh, they are found circumglobally. We know that they are filter feeding sharks. So they're one of three filter feeding sharks, with the mega mouth and the basking sharks being the other two. And we know that they. Um, are true sharks. So they get this name whale from the fact that they're so, so, so large and that they eat small planktonic prey in the water column, like a baleen whale would. Um, they are not a whale at all. They are indeed a true shark. They have a cartilaginous skeleton. Uh, they don't have a swim bladder. They don't have to come to the surface to breathe air. Uh, they're not warm blooded. All of those characteristics are very different from a whale. So uh, they are indeed true sharks. Whenever I hear people call them whales, it's like nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> Um, and they do have teeth. Um, a lot of people think that uh, whale sharks don't have teeth, that they're just, they are indeed filtering out prey in the water column and they're passing that prey through their filter pads. But this is a nice close up image of the teeth of a whale shark. And their genus, which is Rhynchodon, actually means wrasse tooth in Latin. So it translates to that. But unlike the other toothy sharks that we think of, whale sharks don't really use their teeth for feeding. Uh, we think. We don't really know, but we think that these teeth may be involved in mating. Uh, and in shark species, a lot of the time, the male will grab onto the pectoral fin of the female and help kind of maintain body position and control. Uh, but they do indeed have teeth. Their mouth is very large, though. Uh, however, despite the mouth being very large, their throat is very tiny. It's about the size of a quarter. So while you may feasibly be able to fit inside the mouth of a whale shark, it could not swallow you if it wanted to. Uh, and they are carpet sharks. They're in the family Erectolobiformes. Um, and those cousins, those closest relatives of the whale shark are the zebra shark and the nurse shark. And that's very different from what we think about with the whale sharks. So we know that these sharks can kind of sit on the bottom, hence the name carpet sharks. They stay towards the bottom, towards the benthos. And they can kind of just stay there and, and don't have to swim to breathe. And they can pass water over their gills with these adaptation called spiracles. However, the whale shark is the only one in this family that kind of adopts a, a pelagic open ocean lifestyle where it's constantly swimming around in the open ocean. So I always find that interesting when I, when I see zebra sharks or nurse sharks. I don't know if you guys have seen those, but they have a very different lifestyle and a very different characteristics of the whale shark, yet they're the closest cousins to these guys. We know that whale sharks can be found all across the globe, circumglobally in these tropical and warm temperate seas. And really anything with a, a water temperature above 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, is, is kind of suitable habitat to see a whale shark. Uh, we think that there's about 75% of the global population in the Indo-Pacific and about 25% in the Atlantic. 
And we know that they can conduct these really long horizontal migrations of tens of thousands of miles. And we also know that they can dive really deep. Uh, a lot of these tags that we put on whale sharks, uh, they're, they're rated, they can only last to 2000 meters or 6,000 feet. And whale sharks are diving past the capabilities of these tags. So we know that they're really using a lot of this horizontal and vertical space in the water column. And we think they're, they're, they are they are the deepest diving recorded shark species. And we think they're going way past 2000 meters. We just don't have the technology to kind of keep up and, and understand that yet. But in terms of the water column and the, their, their distribution, we think they're using a lot of vertical and horizontal space in these tropical and warm temperate seas. In terms of their conservation status, they were listed as endangered in 2016 by the IUCN Red List. And this is the uh, global authority on, on species trends and listings and, and things of that nature. They were vulnerable. They did a reassessment and they found that they were endangered. And they found that they were endangered because they, they noticed a decline of about 63% in the Indo-Pacific over the past 75 years. We think that these, these sharks are maturing at around 25 years. Uh, that's when they reach maturity and they can start reproducing. So that 75 years is about three generations. And they saw a decline of about 30% in the Atlantic over this same time period, this three generations, which is about a 50% decline worldwide, um, which is troubling. It's, it's concerning. Uh, and let's talk about kind of why that, that, why that trend and why that conservation status may have changed. And largely, this was due to directed fisheries. Uh, prior to 1985, there was no real demand for whale shark products. They weren't really targeted. That demand started to increase in the early 1990s. A lot of it was driven by liver oil. Uh, these sharks have, have very fatty livers, which allowed them to kind of maintain their buoyancy. Uh, they don't have a swim bladder, so that's a way to get around the, the need for not having a swim bladder. And a lot of these island nations could catch these sharks harvest them, take that swim bladder, extract that oil from it. And that swim, that oil is a natural waterproofing. So they could put it on their boats and then they could waterproof their boats. Uh, and that's primarily where the fishery in the Maldives started in about the 1990s. Uh, other countries such as Taiwan, if you can land the shark so close to shore, uh, they used to call it tofu shark because they would eat it. They would consume it. If you can't land it close to shore, it spoils pretty quick, quickly because it has urea and, and really nasty things in it. And then largely in kind of recent years, the shark fin soup trade has driven a lot of the, the capture and the demand for whale shark products. However, a lot of these countries that used to fish for whale sharks have, have banned their whale shark fisheries. And they've banned them because they've noticed that it's, they're not really productive. There's been declines and you have to put more effort out to catch the same amount of sharks. Or you've had steep declines in the amount of catches that you've had. Uh, Maldives is one of the first ones. And in the Atlantic, closer to kind of home here. Cuba had a really small scale fishery for whale sharks in the 1990s as well. Maldives banned their whale shark fishery in 1995, but we can see here on the list that Taiwan was the last country to ban their whale shark fishery in 2007, 2008. So if we think of kind of, uh, of how long it takes a shark to get to maturity, how long it takes them to get back to reproducing, uh, we still may be experiencing the effects if, if it takes 25 years for that to happen of these fisheries around the world, which is why numbers kind of aren't really rebounding and we're not seeing really any steady changes in them. Bycatch was also another um, issue with whale sharks. Uh, and this is because of these tuna purse seine fisheries. So these fisheries that are aiming to capture tuna. And they do this by setting a, a nice big net in the water column Wrap, hopefully encompassing some tuna in there. Then they pull that net up from the bottom and capture the tuna in there. However, they began to notice that since whale sharks are so big, these are, these are giant floating objects in the middle of the ocean and they act as fads and fads are fish aggregating devices. And we fishermen know that they can put this material, this debris, these fads out there and fish will school underneath them because it offers them some level of protection. It's, it's one less angle, one less uh, place to be attacked from. So these fish would often come school under whale sharks, get some level of protection, and then tuna either would get protection as well, or they'd be trying to capture and feast on the fish that are swimming underneath them. So there is this really kind of strong, tightly linked association with tuna and whale sharks. And the fishermen, they do this for a living. They, they began to learn that association. And often when they saw a whale shark, they would say, okay, there's probably tuna underneath that. Let's set our net around that whale shark. 
let's pull it in, let's get the tuna underneath it. And then they would do what you see in this image. They would put a rope around the tail, pull that animal back out, put it in the water and say that it swam away free and it was unharmed. This animal has a, a skeleton made of cartilage. It weighs a lot of pounds and the pulling it by the tail and having it support its own weight on land likely isn't doing well for the survival of that shark. So a lot of these incidences where they say the shark swam away fine, we have no idea what the post-capture mortality of, of these events are. However, promising news, in July of 2015, all five of the tuna regional fisheries management organizations have banned the intentional setting of nets around whale sharks, and they've adopted these conservation measures on how to safely and properly remove a whale shark with a, from a net if you incidentally, um, accidentally captured the shark. And that does not involve towing it backwards, that does not involve towing it by a crane and having it support its own body weight and all of that stuff. And then also some more threats. Uh, I mentioned that a lot of countries had directed targeted fisheries for whale sharks. Um, once those fisheries ceased to exist, they still wanted to kind of make money from whale sharks. So a lot of countries have switched over to tourism. And that's a good thing. However, there's pros and cons with tourism. We, we know that if you switch over from direct harvesting to conservation, that's good. However, there's a wrong and a right way to do this, right? So bringing a whale shark into shallow water so a, a child can take a picture on its head likely isn't the right way to do tourism. Um, I've done a lot of work out in the Maldives for the Maldives Whale Shark Research Program. Uh, it's a highly tourist country. Everyone's coming there to see whale sharks and it is it can get out of control. And we see a lot of sharks that bear the results of these. And more people means more boats, means more injuries, means more boat strikes. Um, and this is likely having a threat for whale sharks around the world, even though people are trying to conserve them because they make much more money off of a live whale shark than a dead one. Um, and we've done some work. We can we see that these sharks can recover from some pretty nasty injuries. However, kind of the long-term effects of these repeated boat strikes and these injuries and, and how that affects fitness and survival and, and all of that stuff is, is largely not understood yet. And then there's been some conservation measures for whale sharks. They were listed in CITES Appendix 2 in 2002. And this means that basically any whale shark product needs to be documented. So if, if somebody's trading whale shark products around the world, this should theoretically be documented, listed of what country it's coming from, what country it's going to. And this even means research samples. So when we sample whale sharks and try to collect science and data on them, we have to go through this CITES uh, protocol. Um, and it also means that any export needs to come from a sustainably managed population, which there are none. So theoretically, there should be no trade of whale shark products, fins, meat, anything of that. Um, so the future looks good, right? If, it's, if there's been fishing bans, species level protections in a lot of these countries that used to fish for whale sharks, I told you that there's no fisheries anymore. Bycatch, they implemented measures to not intentionally set nets around whale sharks. Um, a lot of places have switched over from fisheries to tourism, right? So we're looking good for whale sharks. However, there are still threats. Uh, despite all those kind of conservation measures and the bans on fishing, there's this illegal and unreported fishing that still happens and still occurs. And we know that this occurs because there was an undercover report in 2014 that found that a factory in China was processing about 600 whale sharks a year. Um, and that's huge. That's a, that's a big number. Um, and you can't really fault or blame fishermen where these fins can catch fetch anywhere between $20,000 to $30,000. Um, and these people are just trying to feed their families, right? So it's a very, uh, there's high incentive for a lot of people to kind of harvest and can capture these sharks. Um, and it's largely driven by the, the shark fin trade. And the really upsetting and, and sad thing about that is that the fins aren't really used in the shark fin soup themselves. They're just very large and they act as kind of natural advertising as billboards for shops that sell shark fin soup. Um, this bottom picture on the left was a, a shark that was seen in the Maldives. Somebody had tried to cut off its dorsal fin. Um, however, this is that shark seen many years later, seems to be doing fine, seems to not really by, be affected by the lack of the dorsal fin. So we know that they can recover from some pretty nasty and, and uh, nasty injuries. But it's thought that in that 2016 IUCN report where they listed them as endangered, that this fishery in the South China Sea is the largest direct threat to whale shark recovery in the Indo-Pacific. So really, it's still still a big issue. Fishing is, is an issue despite kind of these species levels protections where they're protected in a lot of these countries. And then this paper, this paper is brand new. It came out this year and it, it highlighted that vessel collision, collisions may be a 
a higher rate, a higher threat to whale sharks than previously thought. And this was a global, really a collaborative paper where all these researchers that tagged whale sharks contributed their, their tracks and their tags. This woman um, looked at the whale shark tags, looked at the vessel traffic uh, data as well, and started to see where these were overlapping. And she found that about 92% of the shark's horizontal space and nearly 50% of the vertical space overlapped it with these large vessels. And we can see kind of a whale shark down here in the bottom left that's been struck by a ship. Um, nearly a third of the whale shark hotspots overlapped with high collision areas. You would think that if these tags, these satellite tags that we're putting out are popping off randomly, that it would be random where they start to pop off. But she found that there was a high correlation that these tags were popping off and coinciding with busier shipping lanes, lanes than expected. So, so not a random effect, uh, uh, effect that potentially these, these ship strikes may be more cryptic, more, um, more lethal than we previously thought. And what's hard to kind of dive into all of this is that if a whale shark dies, it's going to sink. It's more dense than water. It's not going to float on the surface. So if a whale shark does get hit by a ship, we don't know that. We don't have a carcass. We don't have an necropsy to perform. A lot of the times they're going to sink to the bottom and no one will know any better. So this paper really highlighted the fact that these vessels may be a contributing to a population declines despite these international protections and, and low fishing mortality that may be occurring because of the ban on fisheries. So this is really eye-opening and I think it re, re changes how we think about protecting areas and, and how we think about shipping traffic and all that sort of stuff. And then lastly, uh, whale sharks are the largest fish in the sea, but there's still so much we don't know about them. And I think that's still a threat as well. Um, how can you protect a species when you don't know kind of some very basic biology and ecology of the species. And this largely is, is reproduction, mating, pupping. Uh, we don't know where whale sharks reproduce. We don't know where they mate. We don't know where the babies are. We hardly know where females are. And that's really important when you're trying to protect areas and protect the species. If you don't know where those events are occurring, it's really hard to try to protect those areas so that they can, they can be provided with an attempt to, to rebound and recover. Um, the one thing we know about whale shark reproduction comes from one pregnant female that was harpooned in Taiwan in 1995. This is this bottom picture. She had 300 embryos, all at different stages of development inside of her. They did genetic testing of 30 of those embryos and found that they all had the same father. So that made them think that uh, females can store sperm and they can choose to fertilize those eggs when, uh, when the time is right. And that makes sense if, you're, if your mating opportunities are few and far between, you really want to maximize your, your reproductive output. So storing sperm is, is a nice strategy. And a lot of these embryos were at different stages of development. Um, some were ready to be born, some were just fertilizers. So they kind of think it's, it's kind of like a conveyor belt of, of they're fertilizing as they need and they can pop these babies out when they need to. However, there's been very few reports of, of baby whale sharks around the world, um, probably about 20 to 30. And this video on the right that I'm going to play here was just posted earlier this year out of the Maldives. The Maldives is a place where you, you see some babies and they're born about 60 centimeters. They're very tiny. And we have no idea where they're born. We don't know if they're, if they're giving birth at depth. We don't know if they kind of are benthic and hiding in the, in the deep, dark um, uh, benthic area, uh, if they're using different habitats, but we really don't start to see whale sharks at these aggregation sites until they're about two meters. So from, from 60 centimeters to two meters, there's this whole missing lifespan, this whole missing demographic that we have no idea where they are. Um, and the theory is that they grow pretty fast. If, if you're this small, you're a bite-sized snack for a lot of things. They've been found in the stomach of, of marlin, uh, of sharks as well, but if you can grow past the mouth of your predators, then they can't eat you anymore. So the theory is kind of hide while you're little, grow very quickly, reach a certain size, and then only big things can really, really harm you. But this, this missing demographic, these females, these, these pups, these large adults really is a threat because we don't know where these are. We can't protect them. It makes it nearly impossible to kind of conserve a species. But fortunately for us, whale sharks do form aggregations. This is a 2017 paper that kind of looked at all these aggregations around the world, wanted to look at connectivity between them. Um, we can see that, that there's a lot in the Indo-Pacific where about 75% of that population is. 
some in the Atlantic, the Gulf of Mexico is, is the big one. Um, and Georgia Aquarium has done some research there, tagging whale sharks as well. And we know that in some of these areas, whale sharks are showing up seasonally and they're showing up seasonally to feed on food. So in the Gulf of Mexico, tuna are spawning and they're coming up to kind of feast on the eggs that, that are being admitted into the water column. Um, and then they feast there for a few months and then they likely adopt the feast in a famine lifestyle where they're feasting and then they go to the open ocean until they can find another productive patch of food. On the western coast of Australia, they're showing up to feed on coral spawning and residency and kind of the, popu the population demographics are all pretty consistent among these sites. They are dominated by juvenile males. We know a lot about teenage males. We don't know anything really about teenage females. We don't know where they occur. We don't know if they're in a different habitat. They have different requirements. We don't really know where large adult whale sharks are. And it's thought that these, these juvenile males are using some of these coastal areas where we can easily see them as humans with boats to grow and, and, and reach a certain size, reach maturity, where once they're big enough, they adopt a, a more pelagic open ocean lifestyle. And then once they're open ocean, it's really hard to come across them. Um, and the residency at these sites is all different. Some of the sites are, are seasonal. Some sites like the Maldives, which is number eight on the screen here, they seem to be there all year round. So we think that some areas may be kind of like secondary nurseries where they're growing until they reach a certain size. Some areas are more associated with feeding where they're coming to kind of feast and, and feed on, on local increases of prey, prey abundance. Um, the Galapagos number 12 on the 12 on this list here, that's where they see large uh, females, which is very unique, a very unique site, but they largely are transient. They're largely there for one day and then they're gone. So we think that maybe that's kind of a magnetic anomaly in the ocean can serve as a waypoint as they go about their navigating of the ocean. And back to this map, we can see that, that there's a dearth of information in kind of the Atlantic. Uh, in terms of the Atlantic, it's really the Gulf of Mexico where we know a lot about these whale sharks. We don't know much about whale sharks off the eastern coast of South, Af South America. We don't know much about whale sharks off the western coast of, of Africa. So really a, a gap of information and knowledge about whale sharks in this area. And I'm going to show you a slide here of a paper from 2022 that kind of updates these aggregation lists. And we can see that a few aggregations have been added on here. A prettier map. I like it, but you can see Hawaii. There's some people in Hawaii doing whale shark research as well. Peru got added on here. But our what I'm going to talk about tonight is that STH right there. That is St. Helena. That is where Georgia Aquarium has devoted its last few years studying whale sharks. And I'm going to talk about the work that we've done there to kind of put this aggregation, this site on the map. And it really is, is huge because it's an interesting aggregation and it kind of is the first bit of information for whale sharks in that region of the world. So we're really excited to get that out there. This is the updated kind of aggregation list of whale sharks around the world. So while it's important to be able to reliably come across whale sharks and find them, these aggregation sites are nice because it allows us access to whale sharks. We can tag them, we can study them, we can swab them, we can take samples, right? So that's a good first step of being able to find your species to be able to study it. However, we can go a step further and we can take photographs of these sharks. And these sharks are absolutely beautiful. Every time I see one in the water, it's the same jaw dropping event. And we can take a photograph of this area behind the fifth gill and above the pectoral fin. And this acts as a, a natural fingerprint for the shark. So you know how we all have unique fingerprints. These sharks all have unique spot patterns. So this is huge because being able to identify an individual shark allows us to do a lot. It allows us to look at population numbers. It allows us to look at sex ratios. It allows us to look at healing rates, at growth rates, at all at, at connectivity between locations. And it also means that anyone with the camera can collect a very valuable data point of a whale shark. And there's this push, there's this, this global database, I think it's called sharkbook.org right now, that is aiming to capture all of the photographs of whale sharks around the world and put them into one spot. And last I looked, which must have, must have been a year and a half ago, there were more than 12,000, I think that number is much higher now, 12,000 individual whale sharks identified over the world. So a really cool citizen science initiative. If anyone ever sees a whale shark and they jump in the water and have a camera, this is the photograph you're looking to take. So if you can take this photograph, you take a very valuable data point. You have a point in time, you have an, a, an individual. And a lot of times, if they're not named, you can name them as well, which is kind of a more incentive to contribute this data. So being able to find them is important, but being able to photograph them is, is really cool too. And we basically use 
software that was designed by NASA to track constellations. But instead of tracking constellations, we're tracking whale shark spot patterns. So we can run it through this, alg this, this algorithm that searches kind of all the spot patterns you have and spits you out your best match. And then you can visually come and look at them and confirm that it is, it is indeed the shark that you see. And these sharks have such unique spot patterns. Some are very spotty. Some hardly have any spots at all, all. So it's really a cool kind of melding of technology and bringing together of a lot of things to, to study these whale sharks. And this slide is just from that 2017 paper where I showed you all the aggregations. And this is them looking at the sex ratios and looking at the sizes. So I'm just going to use data to illustrate my point that we know a lot about juvenile males and we hardly know anything about females. So this left-hand side is... The global hotspot on the bottom, the percentage of males and females, and those dark blue lines are the females. So we can see that, that that's about a 50% red line there, that the Galapagos there is really the exception to the rule. It is 95 plus percent large female sharks. Um, a lot of these other places, we're looking at 70, 80, 95% males. And this right-hand side is kind of that total size. So that nine meter mark is about the size that we think they reach maturity. And you can see all the average sizes of those sites are pretty much below that. So stressing and highlighting the, the point that we know a lot about these juvenile males. We don't really know about adults and we don't really know about females. And that's what I think myself and Al, my boss at Georgia Aquarium, would love to kind of just explore this unknown missing population and really get at the idea of, of this um that this key, key information is lacking and unknown uh, to be able to protect the species. So females, reproduction, breeding, and pupping. I hope, hope I've hit the nail on the head there that these are very important things to kind of figure out and learn about whale sharks to be able to fully conserve the species. So that's going to lead us to kind of the work that George Aquarium and I've been a part of. But first, we're going to start in 2013 here with a whale shark that was tagged in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this whale shark, they named her Real Lady. They thought she looked pretty girthy in her underbelly. They thought potentially she could be pregnant. She did this really interesting track way far away from the Gulf of Mexico to the north kind of east side of South, Af uh, South America before her tag popped off. And it, the authors thought that maybe since she looked pregnant, couldn't confirm that she was pregnant, but she looked pregnant. Maybe she was doing this big journey, this big migration to, to have her pups. So that led my boss to kind of take a look at the map and be look at what potential areas are in islands or in this area where we could start to maybe reach out to people and see if there are indeed whale sharks seen here. And there's a few, few island nations there, St. Peter and St. Paul rocks, Ascension, St. Helena. And he contacted the folks at St. Helena. St. Helena. He said, Hey, have you seen whale sharks here? What do you know about them? Uh, we're trying to kind of figure out what's going on here in the South Atlantic. And what he got back was really interesting. They said, we've been collecting whale shark research here since 1999. We, of course, get whale sharks here. Here's our data. You can look through kind of the observations and the data that we've taken. And within those data that they collected, there were two eyewitness reports of mating. And this was a, a light bulb, an aha, a holy crap. Uh, there's been two reports of whale sharks mating. One was by a, an experienced fisherman and one was by a fishery uh, person that worked in the government. So the fact that we had eyewitness reports of mating here at St. Helena, that made my boss Al say, when can I come out next? When, when can I be out there to study whale sharks here? Because this was unheard of in the literature, unheard of in the, in the whale shark kind of biology, ecology realm. Um, these are the reports. I Two sharks mating, they came together belly to belly at the surface. Um, and that that is what how we think sharks would mate. They'd come belly to belly to have the have the insertion of the claspers. Um, males going to belly to belly. So kind of two different people giving the same report. So really exciting, really interesting stuff. And that made us then want to go to St. Helena to study these sharks. And we wanted to ask a whole bunch of questions. We wanted to know who was showing up in these waters, what, what sharks, how many sharks were coming, when were they coming, what were they doing in these waters, where were they going when they left these waters, where were they going when they were in the waters, how were they using the vertical and, and horizontal areas around the island. So a lot of these, these basic general questions of how you would go describe an aggregation or a population, what's the sex ratio, um, are they a lot of repeats of the same individuals, are they coming back year after year, and this is when we, what we went there to first kind of explore and, and figure out was to really document this aggregation, document what sharks were showing up, and then try to figure out why they're showing up there and then maybe where they're going when they leave those waters. 
And we did this through a variety of different techniques. Big one is photographic ID. You've seen this slide already. This is huge. Being able to take a photograph of a shark allows us to identify individuals, allows us to see if individuals are coming back year after year, allows us to, to really start to figure out how many sharks are there, um, what size range of sharks are there. And then we can also do sex determination. So we can swim down and look between the pelvic fins of these sharks. In A, male sharks have these two external organs. They're paired called claspers. Um, in females, you just have the, the pelvic fins. Um, and we can also do some sort of, of reproductive estimate as well. This is a juvenile male. You can see the claspers don't really extend past the pelvic fin. But in large, mature males, those are going to be very big um, sausage-like appendices that often have cauliflower or, ca or calcified ends to them. So we can start to really explore if these sharks are in fact mature, if they potentially are reproducing. And then we can look at sex ratios. We can see how, what's the percentage? Does it follow that same juvenile male trend that we see everywhere around the world? And we wanted to know where they're going. And we did this to a variety of, we threw a lot of tags at them. We put a lot of tags on whale sharks. We put 50 in total. Some of these were anchored under the skin and towed behind. Some of these were fin mounted. We did a whole different variety of tags on whale sharks here to try to figure out where they're going when they leave the waters. Um, some of these are active tags that break the surface of the water and then transmit a position. Some of these are passive where they're constantly collecting data and then they break off and then they float to the surface and they start um, transmitting their payload. But a lot of tagging, a lot of efforts in that regard to try to figure out where whale sharks are going. Then we wanted to know when they're coming and how they're utilizing the areas around the, around the island. And we can do this with a different type of tag called an acoustic tag. You can see it's circled here on this whale shark. It's just anchored just ever so slightly under the skin. They have 10 to 15 centimeters of fatty tissue. They hardly react to any of this tagging. Um, but that acoustic tag is going to transmit a unique identifier. And then this bottom right is a receiver. So we can put these receivers around the island if a shark comes in close proximity with that receiver, we then have a data point of a point in time of this individual is in close proximity to this receiver on this day and at this time. And we put receivers all around the island. Um, we put 10 receivers out. We tried to get full coverage of the island. Um, it, the wind comes from the southeast side of the island, so it's kind of treacherous to be there by boat, which really affects our, our sighting and our ability to really work on that side of the island. But we got a fair fair amount of coverage around the island to really figure out if these sharks are staying in one area, if they're moving around the island, where our best efforts should be placed to kind of go out and, and find a whale shark if we want to put more tags out, that sort of stuff. They wanted to know what they're doing. Uh, this is a shark in the Galapagos, but it highlights kind of this point here. This is a, a style of, of fin mounted clamp where that antenna breaks the surface of the water and it can transmit a location of where that shark is. And this orange thing here is a camera tag. And this is part of what I'm doing for my PhD as well, is we're putting these camera tags out, which are recording video footage of whale sharks. So think of like GoPros for a whale shark. It, it allows us to look at kind of a short time frame of the whale shark. Uh, it allows us to look at how they act uh, outside of researchers and us being in the water with them. Um, and this is really nice because this whole device will fall off the shark um, after it's done. So these two little galvanic releases, you can see that the camera tag has broken off and gone to the surface, the tag floats. These galvanic releases will break off after four to six hours, the tag will float at the surface. It's got a satellite tag in it and that allows us to be able to go find it again. Once we find it again, we can download all that footage that we took. And then the bracket as well, the bracket has a galvanic release which will dissolve in salt water and it'll fall off after a, a week or two. So that whole device falls off the animal. It's, it's none the wiser, and we get um, a first-person footage of what that whale shark did for four to six hours of its day. And we really thought if mating is happening, if, if reproduction is happening here, these camera tags are going to be the way to document it. Uh, let the sharks film their own kind of business and then hope we capture it. So really exciting. I'll show you some footage of these camera tags towards the end here. So what do we do? We went to St. Helena. We looked at the government uh, database of the encounters that they had. We conducted expeditions there in 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019. We took a lot of photographs to explore the population demographics of whale sharks. We put a lot of tags, both satellite and acoustic telemetry, to really look at the large and fine scale movements and residency patterns of whale sharks around the island. And we did indeed see whale sharks. 
We saw a lot of whale sharks and these two videos were, this second one really does it justice, but all those little dark teardrop shapes and those fins are all whale sharks at the surface. And this was a feeding aggregation, which wasn't normal. You can see that my mind's gonna be blown here in this video where you could just look out and see whale sharks as far as the eye can see. And it must have been a hundred or so sharks in the size of a football field. And we're all just feeding at the, at the surface of the water. So we didn't see whale sharks. We did indeed see whale sharks. And we found that we photo identified 277 individuals. And we found that the sex ratio was about 53% male to 47% female. So that's about a, a one to one sex ratio an even number of males and females both showing up in the waters around St. Helena. Uh, that ratio stayed the same from month to month. So we thought maybe females were showing up, releasing some pheromone or something that the males would then hone in on and come afterwards. Nope, it seemed that males and females would show up kind of at the same time, um, just in, the, in these waters. We found that the average size for males was 8.4 meters. The average size for females was 7.9 meters. And these are visual estimates. And we know from about three papers now that, that humans are pretty bad at estimating the size of large things in the underwater. So we, we know that we notoriously underestimate the size of large animals. So we think that a lot of these animals are, are pushing that kind of maturity range. They're, they're past that nine meter, that nine meter mark, that eight, eight and a half meter mark that makes them mature. So we, we think that it's an even number of male and female sharks. And a lot of these sharks are adult mature sharks. About 57% of them had injuries. Some of them were very minor. Some of them were missing fins from probably vessel and boat collisions. Some were entanglement issues, probably from discarded fishing gear and things of that. But we took a lot of photographs and analyzed that. And we also had researchers from Okinawa Aquarium in Japan, which have whale sharks as well come out. And these guys are kind of the forefront of whale shark research. They've designed underwater ultrasounds to be able to kind of take an ultrasound of a whale shark underwater. And we thought, hey, we're seeing large sharks here. Some of these large females have big bellies. P potentially they could be pregnant. Let's let's bring these guys out and see if they if they are indeed pregnant. And these guys came out and we didn't really have a good few weeks when they were out there. So I don't think we really saw any candidate that was really ideal, but they did ultrasound some large females and didn't find that any of them were pregnant. And they're doing the same te technique in the Galapagos where we're seeing those large female sharks as well. And they're finding the same thing that, that a lot of these sharks aren't pregnant. So it kind of keeps that mystery alive of where these pregnant sharks are. And it also goes to show you that just because a shark has a big belly doesn't mean it pre it's pregnant, kind of similar to humans as well. So those assumptions that we make aren't necessarily true. So having kind of the science and then bringing the technology to, to kind of dive deeper, but he was able to look at heartbeat and, and things of that nature and internal organs. And it's really cool, really awesome science that these guys are doing. And then when, when are whale sharks coming? Is it seasonal? Is it year round? This left graph is kind of the encounter data from all of the sighting database that the government had. And this right sign is, is corroborating that data with the acoustic tags that we put out. And we can see the same general trend. Whale sharks start to kind of show up in December, but there's this huge peak in January, February, March, April. By May, they start to really die down. So it was nice that these two pieces of information, both the visual observations from both side things and the acoustic tags communicated and mar married up together. So we know that these sharks are showing up seasonally at the beginning half of that year. Where they go when they leave those waters, that's still a mystery. This is a map just showing kind of where all of those sightings were occurred. Those two big blue stars are where those mating events happened. You can see they're a little bit farther offshore. The red crosses are where we put all of our receivers. So our, all of our receivers are pretty much in a good location to understand how whale sharks are moving ar around um, the island. And we found that there's, similar to the sighting um, database, there's a, a a aggregation, more, more time spent in that northeastern side of the island there, where a lot of those green dots are. Um, there was 985 whale shark sightings that the government had collected between 1999 and 2019. And those sighting databases also showed this distinct seasonality encounters in January, February, March. Um, a few of the aggregations were, were a lot of individuals, over 30 sharks. And these were remarkable for being feeding aggregations. Um, a lot of the times we see kind of one shark at a time or so. So having having more than one individual was, was unique. So really having 30 sharks or more in, in, in an area at a time was was due to probably probably 
favorable conditions and maybe prey and eggs pooling in kind of these bays and these channels around the island. And then also, where are they going? We put 50 tags out, 30 of those tags reported reliable data. They reported for an average of, of 74 days. So not too bad, but there was no real obvious habitat use um, observed. It was substantial in individual variations of how the animals moved around the islands. So this is kind of, this is a A, B, and C of, of distance away from the island. And I'm gonna zoom into each of these in the next slides, but a lot of sharks close to the island and then very few bit really gave us long scale, long-term data. And this is because a lot of these tags were being crushed. 14 of those tags were released prematurely to the depth, the crush depth being reached. So these tags, once they go past 2000 meters, they will be crushed and destroyed. So a lot of the times they will have a self-preservation where they'll pop off if they sense that they're going too deep and they're coming to the surface to try to save the data. And about half of the tags that we put out, this was happening. So we knew that whale sharks were leaving the surrounding waters and they were diving deep. They were diving deep enough to trigger these tags to be released. And a lot of the sharks, 16 of them reported not a lot of large scale distance away from the island. Uh, in general, there was a northwesterly movement away from the island with, with not a lot of individuals heading to the east. And this is probably because the prevailing current goes this way. So it's easier to swim with the current than into it. We did have some sharks that made it to Ascension. Ascension is the next kind of closest landmass. One shark looked like it started to venture back. So that gives us maybe that hope that there's maybe a little bit more happening in Ascension or Ascension could be a place where we see whale sharks as well, but it's very different from St. Helena, but it was able to, it was cool to kind of see this connectivity here. Nothing really too crazy coming from this. And then our big three tr tracks that moved away from the island was these individuals that traveled these long distances. This, this blue track here made it to Fernando de Naronja, similar to where that tag was of real lady that I first showed you to start kind of our, our journey here, which is really cool because that kind of connects maybe the Gulf of Mexico and St. Helena as these two sharks tags popped off in this area. And that was 3,395 kilometers away from the tagging location. But like the individual variation we saw earlier, we saw variation here. Nothing was really consistent and all sharks went different directions. We had a shark that popped off in the Gulf of Guinea, another shark that ventured to kind of Namibia, the Western coast of Namibia and Angola. So no real trends here, but we did have some successful long tail movements this way. And this is, we, we weren't very successful with our tagging and where sharks were going because of this deep diving behavior. We had eight tags that were able to report diving behavior. Uh, we had 509 daily dives, so each day we had 509 days of from those eight sharks of diving behavior with a median depth of 619 meters and a maximum depth of 18 or 1,879 meters. But what's really interesting is that this kind of 500 to 700 depth bin, this depth range accounted for nearly 66% of all the daily dives. So they're, they're doing something here at this 600 meter range that we don't really know. Why are they diving at 600 meters pretty regularly each day is one of the mysteries that we don't really, really know. But we do know that they're conducting these deep dives and they're, they're likely destroying the tags once they leave the surrounding waters. And then what are they doing? Uh, we had those two eyewitness reports of whale sharks mating. We were able to go and capture these, these, this footage. Um, this is a male shark following a female. And a lot of times when you think of shark mating behavior, this pre-copulatory behavior would be following. And then this is even direct contact here. So I've never seen whale sharks contact each other in the wild. This is the first time I've seen, seen this. And then if we think of what an actual mating event would, would look like, we think the male would grasp the pectoral fin of the female to help maintain body position. And we started to see these, these weird abrasions on the pectoral fins of, of these females. And we think that potentially those could be kind of mating scars where they don't really have toothy teeth like other shark species. They have these raspy teeth. So an abrasion, a scrape, a, a sandpaper-esque wound is kind of what you would, would see. So this further gave us support to our, our understanding that whale sharks are potentially mating in this area. And then the camera tag footage. Uh, the camera tag, tag footage is, is definitely the way to go to try to figure out what whale sharks are doing in these waters. And this, I think, just hits the nail on the head here. We have a ca camera tag on this whale shark. It's approaching another whale shark in the distance there. That shark looks like it kind of arches and moves its body position with its tail up. We're like, this is it. This is it. We're going to capture something unique happening here. Uh, they're getting closer and closer. We were absolutely, our minds were blown when we were watching this. And then this happens. <laughs> 
Getting closer and closer, closer and closer. And then our tag pops off. Oh. So I, it was really exciting, really interesting. Um, we did see other whale sharks encountered on, on the camera tags of other sharks there. But it highlights that these camera tags are potentially the way to go to, to record and, and figure out these interactions that whale sharks may or may not be having in these waters. But really exciting, really interesting. Um, but just just they keep hang on to their mystery a little bit longer. So in summary, we explore the population demographics, the movement ecology, the habitat use. We have a good idea of, of who's showing up, um, when they're showing up, how they're utilizing the waters around the island. However, this underlying question of, of what they're doing kind of eluded us. We have an idea, we have our thoughts, we think that it's an important reproductive habitat, but having some concrete footage and, and, and data would be really interesting in the next step. So reproduction, foraging, are they showing up to forage? We we've had, did see feeding events. Are they showing up to eat and are they mating opportunistically because there's an even number of males and females there? Are they showing up to mate and then foraging opportunistically because the conditions are right and prey uh, funnels into these bays and these channels? What's going on with the deep diving behavior? Why are they deep diving? What are they doing at 600 meters? What's going on down there? So really this, like all science, we, we had more questions, but we were able to really kind of document and understand first and foremost, what's going on, how are they using the waters? And it led us to these next questions of what can we do next? And we published this in Frontiers of Marine Science, and we titled it St. Helena, an important reproductive habitat for whale sharks in the central South Atlantic. And it really was the first paper to put St. Helena, to put information about whale sharks in the South Atlantic here on the map. Um, it's unique from all of these other aggregation sites because remember, these are dominated by juvenile males. The fact that we have an even ratio of males to females and that a lot of them are adults is unlike any of these other sites. And it's probably because St. Helena is not a coastal aggregation. It is as pelagic, as open ocean as you can get. So we're, we're using these little islands to kind of be stopping off points for us to study this, this largely very hard to, to study population of, of adult open ocean whale sharks that are hard to find, hard to tag, hard to learn about. Um, and I think this kind of is just some statistics, but I like it because it says the exceptions were the Galapagos, St. Helena, and Saudi Arabia. So St. Helena, we've, we've, we're the third exception to this significant male bias, the third, the third exec, exception to this, what we know about juvenile males. And we put St. Helena on the map. We learned about whale sharks here. We're also doing work in the Galapagos. And I think the Galapagos and St. Helena are really going to be kind of the, the future avenues of trying to understand more about this this mysterious population, this mysterious demographic of whale sharks around the world. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I will answer any questions you have. I know it was a lot of information I threw at you, but in summary, we kind of documented a new aggregation site, an interesting, unique aggregation site that is unusual and different from all the other places around. And hopefully we can do some more work there to, to learn more about really why these whale sharks are there and, and what they're doing there. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe this isn't a, a good question for you, but from the fossil record, what, what do we got? How, how do we know? You know, you know, I, I saw your right. I saw your title and I thought you were going to ask me a fossil question and I thought you were going to ask that exact question. So I appreciate it. Um, Sorry. That's a good question. We know that these these sharks, they're cartilaginous, right? Cartilage does not preserve in the fossil record at all. So a lot of what we know about any shark, any shark species comes from teeth. So the fact that we, the whale sharks do have teeth, they have 300 tiny little teeth, those teeth appeared in the fossil record. And that's how we can kind of start to track when they, when they appeared. When you say they're tiny, I mean, how big are they? How, how tiny is tiny? Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. You, you can see them visu visibly, but they're nothing substantial. A few centimeters, maybe. Wow. Okay. Cameron, can you see the, the um, chat as well? We have a question from Leslie. 
What type um, of research, if any, are, are you able to do on the whale sharks at the Georgia Aquarium? Um, by the way, she swam with them a few years ago. Awesome. I'm really excited that you were able to swim with them at Georgia Aquarium. And it's, it's really nice to be able to have the sharks in, in kind of in, in the exhibits in the aquarium because it allows us to, to marry up the, the field and, and kind of the aquarium. And we continue to, to take measurements and, and contribute that sort of data where we're constantly observing these sharks. Um, and a lot of cool things that we couldn't be able to do in the wild. Um, you could feed these sharks kind of non-toxic beads and see how long it takes things to pass through the intestinal tract, right? Um, Al, my boss, they used the sharks kind of in the exhibit to, to perfect their techniques for drawing blood on a whale shark. So now we can take syringes underwater, we can swim with the whale shark, and we can collect blood on a free swimming whale shark, which is huge to then use that technique in the wild and collect blood on free swimming whale sharks in the wild. Um, the guys at Okinawa have, have done the same thing. They, they perfected their ultrasounds, right? So we're having these sharks and having access to these sharks really does allow a lot of research that, that marries up with the field. Um, and we can learn about nutrition and, and things like that by having them in the collection and seeing how well they respond to things and then stuff like that. So there's a lot that can be done that, that complements the field and also is kind of unique for the aquarium setting as well. And, and uh, there's been other studies that they've, they think that these whale sharks are, they're being able to smell potentially the um, plankton. They swim with their kind of their nares out of the water column. And there's this, this chemical that plankton release when they're dying, when they're being predated upon by zooplankton. Um, and they squirted that chemical in the, in the exhibit at the aquarium and they saw the response of the sharks. So some really cool stuff that, that basically is better understanding of their physiology and, and things of that nature that just cannot be done in the field. How often do you get to go in the field? So a lot of it is not the, the glamorous work that we present here. So a lot of it's behind the desk, kind of planning, doing logistics. Um, it's nice that St. Helena and the Galapagos, which are the kind of the two big areas where the aquarium focuses their, their whale shark efforts, they're opposite seasons. So it's not like you have to pick and choose one. So sometimes we'll go to both with it within the year, but it's normally one, one field expedition to St. Helena, one field expedition to the Galapagos. Maybe just, we haven't been back to St. Helena for a few years now since we published kind of this information, but I still think there's, there's work to be done. There's efforts to be done there. So maybe twice a year, <laughs> if I'm lucky. <laughs> and who develops the technology for the um, camera tags? Is that you guys or is that? So we work with a company called Cats and, and they're making tags that go on a whole bunch of things. And then these guys are great. The tags are really cool. Um, it's really revolutionary. They have a whole bunch of sensors, accelerometers, all this magnetometers, uh, gyroscopes. So you can really get this fine scale kind of look at how the shark is moving and what its energetics are. And um, they've been used on white sharks. They've been used on all sorts of species around, but it's this company that, that does, does some really cool work. And they, they work with us because we're like, hey, we want to we want a camera tag that can go down, go down to 600 meters that can withstand that crush depth, right? Because that wasn't invented at the time. And they're like, we got you. We'll work on it. We'll make a big camera tag for a whale shark. We're, we're hard in it so it can go to 600 meters so we can try to figure out what they're doing down there. We'll throw lights on it so lights can come on at a certain depth. So it's a really cool kind of collaboration to figure out what's going on. I, I see a question in the chat here. Is there any work on reproduction and preservation for the species at the aquarium? Yeah, so this is a really exciting and interesting question because since we do have, have these sharks at the aquarium, they were from 2005, they were in the Taiwan kind of fishery budget. So they would have been kind of on, on a dinner plate. They got the permits, they brought them here, but they were juveniles, right? So that allows us to then explore how they reach reproduct, how they reach maturity, how development may change, how body, body positioning, body morphometrics, all that stuff may change as they start to reach maturity. And that allows us to better go in the field and say, hey, that, that, that big bump that we saw in the females that may not be pregnancy, that may just be a product of maturity, right? So it allows us to kind of change our angle, change our perspective, but being able to, to see that transition from juvenile to mature is an exciting avenue to, to look at that. And if we consistently can take blood from the whale sharks at the aquarium, we can look at reproductive hormones and how those things are changing. So a lot of cool work can be done. And with the oceans warming, 
how far how far down the road do you guys think your research field will change? Yeah, I think it's definitely going to change, right? We we're going to see kind of this this thermal range of what right whale sharks is going to shift. Um, whale sharks are starting to be seen in the Azores, and we think that that may be a product of kind of this this pole world pole world, world expansion that's going to happen with a warming ocean, right? Um, ranges are going to expand as as these thermal tolerances are going to allow species to live in areas where they couldn't live before, and we think the Azores may be kind of the first glimpse into that. So there probably will be a pole world change. Um, as of yet, they can't really get around the the point of South Africa. It's still kind of too cold for them. And oftentimes whale sharks will wash ashore there. And we think they follow these kind of warm eddies. And then once those warm eddies dissolve, it's just too cold for them and it stuns them and they kind of come ashore. So if, if those kind of start to meet, then we could have a whole different conversation about connectivity between oceans and between all that sort of stuff. So, and potentially the, the equator and that, that band could get too hot for them and they could be pushed them out of their range and then create a a two distinct kind of geographic subsets of a North and a South Atlantic or population and stuff like that. So it'll be interesting to see how that affects them um, metas metabolism wise as well, but a changing ocean is going to definitely change kind of how they interact with it. Does anyone else have any questions? I have so many questions, but. <laughs> Well, I think this was fantastic, and um, I, I'm very excited for anyone who couldn't make it here tonight to experience it on our YouTube channel, because um, I'm going to spread this like the common cold. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, we welcome you to come back and follow up with some of your research. It's pretty exciting. Um, everyone else is in agreement. This is great. Oh, what is next for you? Adrian asks. What is next to me? That is a great question. So I'm working on finishing up um, some two other chapters of my PhD. So one of those is largely looking at those camera tags that I, I showed you here, um, trying to figure out kind of those fine scale movements. I think somebody needs to mute. I'm just going to mute off. There, that sounds better. So trying to figure out kind of those fine scale movements. Uh, we tried to deploy some more camera tags of the Galapagos. It's easier said than done. We have to recover those tags, which is really the detriment to, to chucking expensive things in the ocean. So a lot of the times we can't get these tags back. So that makes it really hard to analyze that. And then the second part is I'm also looking at microbes. I'm looking at microbes at Georgia Aquarium and how those microbes may be influencing or influenced by sharks in, in, in their new exhibit here. So a different step, but it's all kind of connected. Um, and then my ultimate goal would be to work at, for research and conservation at the aquarium and kind of take up their whale shark research and, and be the whale shark guy at the aquarium. So I, I could talk about whale sharks for days. I love the species. So it just makes, makes sense to kind of mirror up with the aquarium and do, do whale shark work there. I keep putting questions into Sorry. the chat. <laughs> well, uh, Judith asks if there are any whale sharks in Baltimore. There, so there are whale sharks that have been seen as far <clears throat> north as kind of Massachusetts. So there, there have been some sharks that have tagged. We don't know if those have kind of been the similar story I said of following these warm eddies and then kind of being in the wrong place. But we know that they followed the Gulf Stream. We know that they migrate kind of past Fort Lauderdale, uh, Palm Beach. Uh, so I think if you're on a boat and you see a whale shark out there, hop in the water and take a picture. I, I don't think it's against the realm of possibility. Ah, the Baltimore Aquarium. I do know the, the Georgia Aquarium is the only aquarium in kind of the, the northern, the western hemisphere that has whale sharks in their uh, exhibit. I'm unmuted. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, you were talking about what the future is going to bring with the warming. Um, in 2018, this paper was published uh, where uh, they researched two of these frozen lakes that were found in Greenland um, that were from previous warming periods. And uh, what was cool, you know, they found all these insects 
frozen and the like. And they were able to determine by the, uh, the insects that it must have been so warm that there was no North Pole at that the time, mm. the times they studied. Yeah, so I mean, that's going to significantly impact kind of their habitat that they can they can have right they could they have could have potentially free range of the whole <laughs> the whole oceans yeah wow. Very good. well i want to thank everyone for attending tonight i especially want to thank cameron for um, a fascinating absolutely fascinating presentation we really enjoyed it um and again really Keep us posted because it's pretty darn cool. I love all these um, mysteries. You've got to yeah. solve them. They're the largest fish in the sea. And it just still blows my mind that there's so much that we don't know about them. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. It was awesome. Thank you. You have a wonderful evening as uh, I hope everyone else does as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for making the time for us. <laughs>